what I'm talking about today is this is basically a follow up to a talk I gave a few years ago at uh, DEF CON 18 about looking at information that's freely available out there on the net and uh, doing some um, trending and analysis of it and trying to make something useful out of it. So a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm currently I'm the director of technology at the Center for Law Enforcement Technology Training and Research, which is a it's a nonprofit research center that got spun out of uh, work that I used to do when I was a professor at the University of Central Florida. I, I was there for um, about 10 years, and I in the engineering program taught computer engineering. I developed the computer security curriculum there and uh, did embedded systems among some other things. Eventually moved away from teaching and more into research and we ended up spinning out that research into an independent uh, nonprofit center. Uh, I'm also CTO for uh, Hoverfly Technologies and prior to this I used to uh, work as a research associate up at uh, the Institute for Security Technology Studies at Dartmouth College. So over the course of the last 20 years, some of the things that I've worked on are up here on this list. And, you know, it took me quite a while to catch on to kind of what, like, the common theme between all of the things I was working on, because I'm kind of slow to pick up on these things at times. And eventually, as I started um, putting it together and kind of realizing some of the same things that I was coming across and the same things I was doing, I realized that all of this stuff from uh, information sharing that I'm working on now to uh, hardware sensor networks uh, to intrusion detection systems, uh, they really all rely on some of the basic concepts of sensor data collection and in particular sensor fusion. Because like everything that, everything that we're doing in, in um, all of those uh, things that are listed up, that I listed up there, they're all based on taking some sort of sensor and using it to try to get some measure of reality. But the sensor always has some limitations. Sometimes it's a significant one, sometimes it's you know, not so bad. But every sensor that we look at reality, including ourselves, including when we view things, it's always got some sort of limitation and it's one particular view and that influences the data we're seeing. And you can get, we have to work towards trying to get, get uh, more meaningfulness out of the data that we have. One of the ways that we do this, and one of the things, the techniques that I, I find uh, most versatile, I'd say, is um, sensor fusion, where we take multiple sensors, we take multiple ways of looking at the same thing, and kind of put that together with the hope that we can take the limitations of one observation and cancel it out with a different observation that has a different set of limitations. So at least that's the hope. At least, you know, if we can put two halfway decent things together and get something that's more than the sum of its parts. So before I get kind of more into my stuff, I always feel like with this, in this particular subject that I have to give an acknowledgement to uh, the, the guy that, ins that inspired kind of some of these thoughts in my head. And it was actually at DEF CON, way back at DEF CON 13, uh, Broward Horn gave this talk on meme mining for fun and profit. And his, his problem, you know, all great ideas come out of a problem and I, I mean I guess all, you know, a lot of bad ideas come out of trying to solve a problem too but his was a, uh, his, his was a really good idea. His problem was that he would find that he would like start learning some new technology, some new tool or at least it was new to him and by the time he felt he had mastered it, it was kind of on the way out or the market, the job market was just saturated with people doing that now or it had just fallen by the wayside, nobody cared about it. And he was always kind of struggling with trying to figure out what should I spend my time studying, what should I uh, learn to kind of get ahead. And he ended up uh, kind of thinking about this as like everything's got this sort of saturation curve where it, a trend starts happening and there's a little bit of chatter about it and eventually it starts taking off and everybody hears about it when it's big and growing and then it kind of gets boring and old. But he wanted to try and identify these things earlier on. And went through and did it, this is a slide pulled out of his um, old presentation, uh, where he, what, what he would do is he would look at news sources and, um, and forums and blogs if, uh, for, for information and keywords and, and kind of pull those out and see what was trending on there with the idea that that's kind of a precursor to uh, seeing that early chatter about it and something can take off. This one in this particular case, this is uh, 
the, the red line shows how many times the word palladium showed up in news reports and uh, forums, and the blue is the uh, price of palladium. And you can see that clearly there was a lot of chatter about it before the price spiked up, and then it actually, the chatter dropped off before the price comes back down. So it's a really good, you know, apparently a really good indicator for predicting the, the, uh, the future there what's going on. So anyway, that kind of, that, that thought ins inspired me. And when I was, uh, when I was uh, teaching, I'd have students who would come to me and they, they would want to know what do they need to, to, what skills do they need to get a good job and all of that. And I, I tried to apply what Broward had done uh, in, in a similar way by monitoring and observing trends. And this is uh, mostly single variable observation. It's doing some correlation. Uh, and I started off looking at Craigslist data. Just because Craigslist is nicely available, it's well organized by geographic location, and it, you can go in in certain categories, like where they have the job postings in there, it's categorized by different types of jobs. And I know like, you know, Craigslist isn't necessarily the best place to look for jobs, but it was kind of had some interesting properties in that it's a lot of small companies that post on there. Uh, that are maybe trying new things. A lot of entrepreneurial companies, uh, startups, things like that are posting. They're not so much the big ones. So that, that actually tends to skew it a little bit more towards being a lead, leading indicator, something that is uh, pre, uh, will, will come out ahead of, a bit ahead of the curve. So some of the things I ended up looking at, just because I found correlations in here, were jobs, uh, items for sale, and adult services. And I mean, I didn't, I'm not saying I looked for adult services on Craigslist. It's just my research took me there. <laughs> so, so you know, things I saw looked like this. This is just this is an example. This is just showing job postings by date, and uh, there was a. This is a showing the, the the dips you see there. This is a weekly trend, and these are some different cities. It goes kind of dead on the weekends. There's a spike on a Monday, spike on a Friday. You see this kind of pattern, and it's okay, fine, whatever. It's kind of boring, but, but you know, sort of interesting, not unexpected. But there are certain things that started standing out when you look at this data. In this particular case, there is uh, you know one one of the things that jumped out at me was Austin never had a spike on a Friday. It always dropped off. You, it's kind of hard to see, but it's the orange line in there. It never has a second spike in it. thought that was kind of interesting. The other thing, and this is what came out of the adult services, was that there was a correlation between adult services being offered and bicycles being for sale, or actually a lot of items being for sale. And um, this led to a couple interesting discussions that were one of my favorite moments at DEF CON was when somebody stood up in the audience and said, hey, I think I can help you out. I'm from Austin and my sister's a prostitute. So, the, um, so uh, that and then there's a, it led into a discussion of things you can sell one time like a bicycle and something you can sell over and over and over again. So, um, so okay, that's what I had done before and we had looked at that and there's some interesting stuff there. But I wanted to kind of dig a bit deeper into the data and look for more relationships and more correlations between data and hopefully be able to pull in other sources and do uh, some fusions on this. So I started looking for things like si different cycles in like the job postings or correlations, correlations in them. Because at the time when I was working on this, keep in mind I was, I, I was really trying to help out some of the students that were graduating looking for jobs, trying to help them find out what skills they needed, what would really kind of help them get ahead. <sighs> There were, there were definitely correlations in there. You know, there are things in the cycles you'd see, but nothing unexpected, nothing really interesting that jumped out uh, in related skills. You know, you can say, like, you could uh, say that if a job was going to uh, have um, one particular uh, tool set or skill set listed, there are other ones that are likely to be listed with it as well. Again, it was nothing, nothing really jumped out at me uh, as being unexpected out of it. But eventually there were a couple interesting things that showed up one that I think is just kind of funny, and it was, it was how often the words drug test or drug screen showed up in a job advertisement re correlated with the different skills in it. And apparently, like, <laughs> if you don't think you're going to pass a drug test, don't bother learning SAP because it's not going to do you any good. Um, you know, on the other hand, if you want to develop iOS applications, <laughs> you know, not, go knock yourself out. Uh, you know, I guess there, there's probably some logic here is like how corporate or uncorporate the environment is, I suppose. Um, another thing was uh, looking at, uh, at, at jobs that had benefits and uh, like retirement and health and medical. Um, you, you know, the, the interesting one, the best one was COBOL, but I think it was a bit of an outlier because there were just so few jobs offered with COBOL and I guess to get like any like old grizzled COBOL programmer to come work for you, you got to give them a lot of benefits. 
Um, you know, uh, things like Python and Android and HTML, looking for somebody to develop your web page, you're not going to give them much in uh, benefits, I suppose. So, as I was looking into this, I, ca I came across, uh, I actually, this is, this is much more recently, this is earlier this year, I came across this article. This is actually out of the Journal of Psychology, where some psychologist, um, Dorothy Gambrell, was doing something similar and actually went through and looked at the missed connections part of Craigslist. And if you haven't ever been there, this is where people like say, oh, I saw you as I was walking across the parking lot and tried to catch your eye. And then they go and post this up on the internet hoping that person will find this and somehow make a connection with them. And these are organized by state. These are where people make the, or had the most missed connections. And it kind of, there's some things that just make me, I find funny, like Walmart's got a lock on the south, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, Oklahoma, it's the state fair, of course. You, you know, it makes perfect sense. And, and, you know, in Nevada, it's casinos. And, and the one thing that I just, I just had to put this up there, was one thing that just jumped out at me like crazy was, was Indiana. It's at home. Like, <laughs> well, I don't know what they're doing in Indiana, but I'm pretty sure they're doing it wrong. <laughs> so, uh, so I was talking with a, a friend of mine about this stuff, uh, Dave Grubleski, and he, his eyes lit up and he started telling me about this thing that he had done where in his neighborhood, this is back in Orlando, Florida, his neighborhood, they'd had a rash of crime recently. And he, they didn't really know they had a rash of crime until all the neighbors got together and started talking with each other. And they found out a whole bunch of, everybody knew a little different incident that had happened. So he went and did some searching and found out there was some open source data that the sheriff's office and police department would post about their their CAD, their, uh, their dispatch calls. And he started writing this uh, little tool to take that, do some geolocating on it, and tweet it out. And then you can subscribe to it and uh, get tweets from this thing, like, like really hyper-local things for your neighborhood about what's going on there. And it's actually one thing that's funny. I kind of pulled, I just pulled this up uh, earlier today. And like, I, you know, I was just noticing things. This is back, this is in Orlando area, you know, the first tweet that's on there, and I'm amazed that the, you, you know, the sheriff's office is putting this out, they're basically saying there's a designated patrol area available, which means there's an area where there's nobody patrolling it currently. And this is down like in a real tourist trap part of Orlando, so, you know, I mean, that could be useful information to somebody to know there are no cops there right now. And then there's a few accidents, and then I guess the people down at the bottom down on Poppy Avenue would be happy to note, note there's a fugitive from justice running around in their area. So this kind of led us to like look into more sources for data because what they offered uh, where we were wasn't very, wasn't very uh, useful or organized. And we found out and started looking in places that kind of subscribe more to the open gov uh, system. And this is a movement to have more transparent uh, government data. Uh, some cities publish huge amounts of data about what's going on in their city with the fire department, police department, uh, live interesting data in uh, Seattle, Boston, Chicago, a number of others. These are three that we spent a bit of time looking at. Uh, there's information about uh, incidents that are going on, like police fire. In, in Chicago, you can actually track where the snow plows are in the city. You can track where garbage trucks are in real time from, from, the, uh, from the city, which I, I just find really kind of fascinating. Um, there's information about where bicycle racks, public toilets, landmarks, and even where cameras are, where, where the city has all of its cameras posted, which I, that one I thought was actually particularly interesting, because you can really go on here and make a map of what is an observable location throughout the city and what is not an observable location which again, that could be useful information for somebody. Um, here, here's something, the, the Seattle one's great. They've got their visualization tools built right into this thing. And this is a, um, uh, this showing a map showing police incidents uh, over a period of time around in part of Seattle. And I pulled up this area and you'll notice that like most of it, everything's kind of in that same yellow orange, except for this one big glowing red blob out there. And you know, over in Georgetown, I don't know if anybody's from Seattle here, but I'm like wondering what the heck's going on over in Georgetown. And you can look in a little bit closer and right next to it is the Boeing Propulsion Engineering Labs which, you know, that, that makes me feel really good. Um, so, so coming back to like an area I know a bit more about back in or Orlando, we pulled up 
data that had, uh, we pulled out traffic tickets. Because they, they don't publish information about like who got the ticket or what exactly what the ticket was for, but you can see when there was a traffic stop occurred. And um, I, we, we looked at it and pulled data that covered three roads in the area. And these are, this is right out by the University of Central Florida. These are three roads that they all run east-west and they're kind of the three major roads, just kind of ones right into the university, ones a bit north, ones a bit south. And they all have about the same amount of traffic on and they all have a very similar traffic pattern. And when we went through, and, and what this chart is showing here is, um, it, this is each one of the kind of groupings is a, uh, is a, uh, a week long period, all uh, uh, five weekdays. And then it's repeated over six weeks. And one of the things that I found really interesting was the chance of, of a traffic ticket occurring uh, on, a, on one of these roads, the order, it, it, it was always likely at different times of the day. It, it always followed the same sort of pattern, particularly between uh, this Highway 50 and University Boulevard, that the, uh, the Highway 50 traffic stops always preceded the University uh, Boulevard traffic stops. And when you go out there and you look at the traffic, the traffic pattern's not really any different. So if you start thinking about this and start putting together, well, why, you know, why do you always see one before the other? I don't have, you know, I don't have hard evidence to back this up, but what our belief is is that you're seeing a influence of the patrol pattern of the police in, in the city. So you're actually able to kind of get in there and through their information that they're putting out, sort of start tracking them. It's kind of like, you know, there was a talk I went to er er earlier uh, yesterday, I guess it was. Uh, there was a great talk with uh, Brendan O'Connor that was uh, talking about tracking people by seeing, like, information their devices are spitting out on wireless networks. Um, it's, a, it's a similar concept, that they're putting out a lot of information here that is, um, that if you look at it the right way and you take the right pieces of data and put it together, you can pull a lot more information out about what they're, uh, about what they're doing and uh, what's uh, going on. So, you know, why, so by this time I've kind of changed kind of what, what I was uh, interested in doing and probably because I quit teaching and I left the, the university so I don't have students anymore so I'm not that interested in, in helping people find jobs. So now I found it kind of interesting to like look at these, uh, look, look at these uh, government entities and the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the police and, and other things that are going on and also because I've work, uh, worked with law enforcement a lot and it's kind of interesting to see like how on one hand they're very protective of their data but at the same time they're putting out a lot of information that I'm not sure that they quite realize how much that they're, they're, uh, they're putting out there. Frankly, I think it's actually kind of a, a, a good thing. I, I, I like being able to have more information and being able to look back on them and like I say, you know, why should the NSA have all the fun on uh, spying on people? So the What's next with this? And, and uh, there's 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 so much more I'd like to talk about, but these 20 minute talks you have to be kind of fast in. Uh, that what what I'm really in, interested in is actually um, is expanding the sort of the model that we've been using on on this uh, data to be analyzed. We kind of built things that are that are very purpose driven. That uh, one, the first set of analysis we did was very structured around the uh, the uh, seeking out the jobs. Uh, doing that and then kind of got got sidetracked by the crime and, and going off that direction and I want to bring this back back together uh, and and try to build a more robust uh, model for analyzing this data and throw some uh, data mining at this where so far a lot of what we've done has been what I'd say is like hypothesis based where I, I, I make a prediction about something I think I should see in there, some correlation, then go looking for it to try and, and see if it exists in the data or doesn't exist. And I'm sure there's a lot of relations that are in there that are things that, you know, that I wouldn't expect or, or I wouldn't, wouldn't find otherwise. I want to uh, throw a bit of sort of a uh, data mining and kind of uh, that, that sort of uh, blind either, either AI or brute force type approach to finding relations uh, throughout the uh, data. So I think I'm about out of time right now and I'm getting a nod from the back so I'll wrap it up there and uh, if there are any questions I'd be happy to take a couple until they cut me off. Thank you.